Samuel, sit down. We'll get started. Good morning. Boy, what power. Certainly good to see everybody uh, here today. Uh, of course, our smaller children are in their classes, so we won't do an extensive uh, introduction. That'll be reserved for later, but we're certainly thankful for Brother Tom Waycaster, his good wife, April, good wife of only about eight days, uh, but she's still a good wife. And we'll get gooder as time goes on, that'll be sure. Certainly th thankful for him being with us. We have been looking forward to this for quite some time. And we know that Brother Tom will provide us with meat to chew on and with a much benefit that can be derived from this meeting. This is our meeting. He's just the invited speaker. And so let's make sure that not only are we here ourselves, but at the same time we bring in those. And I know there's been many invited and some have been encouraged to come and, and eat with us as an added uh, gesture. And so hopefully they'll be with us very soon. And uh, so let's give our wholehearted attention at this time to Brother Tom Waycaster. Well, I've been looking forward to this meeting for quite some time. I think we planned this about three years ago, if I remember correctly. And this is my first time in this neck of the woods. I came in from the area where McMillan was at, and McMillan is at, and that's beautiful, beautiful country coming down into this valley. You almost convinced me I need to move to this neck of the woods. <laughs> you know, I knew that uh, Jim uh, Dearman was, uh, he kind of shady in some things. <laughs> And he and April put together a surprise for me yesterday when she came driving up and uh, uh, was going to be here for a couple of days. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and while you're turning there, I'm going to just sort of lay some background. I'm beginning to see a little bit of a resurgence in interest in personal work. Uh, this may be a temporary thing. Hopefully it will be a lasting thing. But I'm seeing more congregations who are involved in, in personal evangelism. Uh, probably Brother Rob Whitaker has done a lot to stir up our thinking in that area. And others like him who train in courses like Fishers of Men or just different uh, tools used in personal work. And I wonder sometimes if we really grasp the universal command that all Christians are actually teachers. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, when by reason of time you ought to be teachers, you have need again that someone teach you the rudiments of the first principles of the oracles of God or, have such as, or such as have need of milk and not solid meat. For meat is for those who have exercised their senses to discern between right and wrong. There are also implications in the Great Commission, though addressed to the apostles, Nonetheless, the principle in that is just as applicable to every child of God. You have instructions even here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 and following, in which the Apostle Paul is going to present three different analogies of what the Christian teacher is to be like. Sometimes we tend to separate these analogies and just look at them individually and fail to understand that they have the backdrop of teaching others who will then teach others. In addition, that generation will teach the next generation. I guess maybe a little confession is good here. I think probably my generation, perhaps the generation that came off of World War II, my mom and dad, uh, we sort of started keeping house. We had a lot of growth in the Lord's Church in the early 30s. In fact, we were the fastest growing religious group in America and yet we seem to have lost that somewhere around the 60s or the 70s and we began to decline. Brother Robert Whitaker has pointed out that at the present rate of decline the churches of Christ in America for all practical purposes will cease to exist in 37 more years. That's frightening. 
Brother Ivan Stewart, who did a great uh, deal of personal work, developed the Open Bible Study series. And I can remember back in the 70s and early 80s that he said the Lord's Church would cease to exist in about 55 years. So he was pretty much on target. These, these passages that we're going to be looking at here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 are designed to remind me that I have a personal responsibility to teach. Look at the first two verses, if you will. Paul said when he's writing to Timothy that he wants to encourage him to teach others who then in turn will be able to teach others. Read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, my child, be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I was blessed to be with Brother Bill Boyd yesterday, and he was excited about taking me to the old Philadelphia church house. I did not even know that church house existed. It is the same church where Brother Jesse Sewell preached for a number of years and where he is buried in the graveyard not too far removed from the church building itself. And Brother Bill began to fill me in on some of the background of the history of the Lord's Church in this part of the country. There were so many things I did not know. But I, what dawned on me was that as he was telling me about the growth of the church and those who had been faithful in passing that on to the next generation and then the next generation is a great contribution to where we are now. Many of you are probably second, third, maybe even fourth generation Christians. My dad was a Christian. My grandmother was a Christian. Her dad was a Christian and an elder in the Lord's Church. His dad was an elder and a pioneer preacher during the Restoration Movement. So you see, they carried on the task of taking the gospel to others. That's our responsibility. That's not Jim Dearman's responsibility by himself. It's not Gospel Broadcasting Network. It's not Gospel Meeting Preachers. It's every responsibility of every individual in teaching the word now, i want you to watch how paul develops this he's going to present three analogies in fact we're going to use this under this heading we're going to look at the analogies that he presents and then we're going to look at the application picking up a principle uh, that focuses on that analogy and then we're going to look finally at some anticipation things they anticipate so let's take a look at the analogies. Read with me starting with verse 3. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier on service entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enrolled him as a soldier. I had the opportunity to serve four years in the United States Coast Guard. I know something of what it means to be in the military. There may even be some veterans here who served in the military. You understand what's involved in being a good soldier. I've often thought that there are three essential things to developing and making a good soldier. One of these is you have to have good leadership, do you not? You look at secular history, and there are great men who have turned losing battles into victories just because of their leadership. I read somewhere that Napoleon Bonaparte was involved in a battle and he turned to his drummer and he said sound a retreat and the little drummer boy said sir I don't know how to sound a retreat and so Napoleon said sound a charge and when he did he turned a certain defeat into victory he was a good leader there's another thing that a good soldier needs he needs adequate armament does he not some of you may remember when the first George Bush president decided he was going to kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And if it weren't so serious, it ought to almost be comical when you see these soldiers of the Royal Guard coming out in jeeps with what appeared to be just small rifles facing an enormous armament of the United States military. It's almost comical. You have to have good equipment. And when I have good equipment with good leadership, that adds to the effectiveness of that soldier, the fighting ability of the soldier. And then you also have to have a certain sense of uh, moral upbeat, a sense of victory, a confidence that you're going to win the battle. Sometimes people will go into battle and they'll get engaged in the battle, they'll lose their morale because they see something that may indicate there's going to be a defeat. So when I look at the soldier, I'm thinking of that man who has a great leader. He also has 
adequate armament, and he also has uh, the uh, morale that's built up. He's confident he's going to win the battle. Now look at the next illustration, if you will. This one is in verses 5 and following. And if also a man contend in the games, he's not crowned except he's contended lawfully. He's using the illustrative illustration of an athlete here. I think that may have been one of Paul's favorite illustrations or analogies, that of an athlete. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he referred to those who run in a race. And they run in the physical race knowing that just one person is going to win the race. But we run knowing that all of those who faithfully run are going to enjoy the victory that is theirs. When you think about an athlete, I want you to think about the athlete's stamina. He trains well, he prepares himself well, and he goes into the contest fully assured that he's going to win the contest. He may not, but at least he's got that assurance and that confidence. But one of the things that stands out in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where Paul says that that runner, that athlete, exercises self-control in all things. Some of you may recognize the name Mark Spitz. I think it was in the 1970s that he was involved in the uh, Summer Olympics, and he brought home something like seven or eight gold medals. He went into retirement after that, and it was some years later that he decided he would come out of retirement and he would go back into the Olympics. He didn't bring home eight gold medals, but he did bring home a number of medals, silver medals, bronze medals, and then a few gold medals. But several years after coming out of that retirement and going back in, obviously he wasn't as effective as he otherwise had been. But I remember watching a, a uh, television interview with Mark Spitz, and they asked him, what is your day like? How, what, how does your day normally run? He said, I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, I'm not going to get this exact, but I think you'll get the gist of what he was saying. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I exercise. I swim. And then I shower, and then I eat a wholesome breakfast. I get a little bit of rest. I study theory. And then I swim. I exercise, and I eat a wholesome lunch. And then I get a little rest, and I study theory. And then he says, I exercise some more. I get a little rest. I study theory. I swim some more, and I eat a wholesome dinner before I go to bed seven days a week. In other words, his time was consumed with what he was doing. That's self-control. And self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It's the ability to rein in, to hold in the personal desires in an attempt to achieve a greater goal. You've heard the phrase that delayed gratification is often the best gratification. And it is because it's exercising self-control. Now look at this third analogy. So I have, the, I have the soldier, I have the athlete, and then last of all, I have the husbandman. We might use um, uh, more familiar terminology here, the farmer, if you will. My first work was in south central Oklahoma in a little bitty small farming community. And I had a brother there who I grew particularly close to, and he was always inviting me to come out to his farm. Brother Tom, would you like to come out and fish? Oh, I love to fish. And I would go out to his ponds and fish. And then he would start breaking me into farm life. I knew he had a reason for inviting me to fish first. And he said, I need some help plowing some land. Would you be willing to help me? Absolutely. So he puts me on a tractor. His tractor is over on the other side. This tractor is facing into the wind. And he said, if you know how to drive a stick shift, you can operate a tractor. Well, I knew how to drive a stick shift. He showed me where the gears were at, and I put those things in gears. He lowered the, uh, he lowered the plow, and I started plowing the ground. Beautiful breeze coming at my face. But then when I turned to the left, following in his tracks, that breeze was coming off my right side. Still very comfortable. But I tell you what, when I turned to the left again, all that dirt and dust just came billowing over my head, and I was breathing dust for the lengthy part of the field. I got home that night, and my wife said, where had you been? I said, I've been plowing fields with Herman Bills. And I learned what it meant to be a farmer. They get up early in the morning, sunrise. They get involved in the work. They're active, and they work hard. 
So there you have the three analogies. Now I want to go back through each one of those and we're going to look at the application here. We're going to look at some principles that actually come right out of the text. Some things that Paul is trying to, to tell us. If in fact I have the desire to be that teacher who will take the word of God and teach it to the next generation and then the next generation and on into the various generations. Go back to the soldier for just a minute. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier on Christ. No soldier entangles himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enrolled him as a soldier. I'm looking at this word entangle. That's a word that means to mesh together, to weave together. When I was a little boy, I had uh, what they call Chinese handcuffs. We had a Chinese student come to Memphis School of Preaching several years ago, and he was sitting in the audience when I presented that lesson one time, and he said he's not even familiar with Chinese handcuffs. <laughs> but it really wasn't Chinese handcuffs. It was a little tube that you could put your finger into, and then as you pull your fingers out, that tube would wrap up around your fingers. And you couldn't get it loose except you worked with that. I got entangled in that. Well, I thought it would be a good exercise and maybe dexterity to put five of those on my finger, all five. And so I did that, and I can tell you it was tough getting out. Now, I'm, you're, I'm out, you can see I achieved that. But I got entangled in that. There are a lot of things in life that we get involved in that are sometimes get us entangled, things that could be right in and of themselves. But we lose a sense of priorities, and we start doing things that are really not all that important. There was a Disney movie that came out probably 20 years ago now, The Lion King, and the theme song to that uh, movie went something like this, the word something like this, from the time we arrive on this planet and blinking step into the sun, there's more to see than can ever be seen and more to do than can ever be done. Will you think about that for just a minute? I've been to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. That is an enormous library. I don't know how many books they have in that library. It certainly has to number in the millions. But I would be a fool to think I could read every book in that library. It's not possible. I can't do everything there is to do in this life. And since life is limited, and my time span on this earth is limited, it seems to me that I would grasp this principle of making sure I do the important things first and then do the other things last. Take care of God's business first. Take care of seeking His will, of teaching others, of training ourselves to become good teachers. It's a matter of priorities. You've probably heard the story of the gentleman who walked into his classroom and he had a jar, a big wide mouth jar with big rocks inside the jar. And he said, is the, is the jar full? And uh, they said, the students said, uh, uh, yes. Well, he commenced to reach under the desk and he took out some gravel and he started putting the gravel into the jar and shaking the jar till the gravel settled around the big rocks. And then he said to the class, is the jar full? And they said, yes, now it is. Well, now he reaches under and he gets a bag of sand and he starts pouring sand into the jar and shaking it around the gravel and the rocks till he gets all the way to the top. And then he says to the class, is the jar full? And they said, probably not. <laughs> and then he took water and he poured water into the jar till the sand had soaked up the water and he couldn't get anything else in. And then he said, Watch the, what, is the, what is the value of this illustration? They said something to this effect, there's always room for more or you can always get more in. But he said, no, here's the lesson. He said, if you don't put the rocks in first, you're never going to get them in. That's priorities. And the Bible teaches priorities. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all those things will be added to you. So every one of us as members of the Lord's church, we have the opportunity to look at our time, measure our time, and see what really needs to be done and take care of that first. That's why you are here at Bible class. That's why you cut out a segment in your life every Sunday to gather together and worship your God. It's because you recognize priorities. 
And so in the case of the soldier, there is the need to recognize priorities. Let me move to the next illustration that we cover. And this is the, uh, the athlete. And there's a principle in this also. For in the athlete, here's what Paul says about the athlete. If a man contend in the games, he's not crowned unless he contends. My American standard reads lawfully. We live in an antinomian society today. All, that's just a big word that means people who hate law. You don't have to go very far to see that. We escape a lot of that here in the South. But you go to the West Coast or up to New York City and look how the cities are antinomian. They hate law. They hate it. I want you to listen to what David said in Psalm chapter 1. He said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. He doesn't say one of his delights is. He said his delight, the one delight he had was in the law of the Lord. He could have used the word, word, the word of the Lord, and he would have been accurate. He could have used the word, the promises of God, and he would have been accurate. But instead, he used this word law. Why? Because most people despair when it comes to law. They hate law, and they're antagonistic toward it. I wonder if each one of us were to take a piece of paper and list all of our delights from the top all the way down to the bottom. What would be on the top of that list? I like bluebell ice cream. Do y'all get bluebell ice cream in this neck of the world? It doesn't settle easy on my stomach anymore, but I like it. It's a delight. I delight meeting brethren all across the brotherhood, but my one great delight and your great delight ought to be this, this right here. His delight. So when I look at this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said so far as the uh, athlete is concerned, he has, to, he has to contend lawfully. I'm probably speaking to an audience that understands you have, to, you have to follow the pattern. You have to stand in the old paths. You have to conform to the authority of Christ. That's something that the world doesn't seem to be able to grasp. I don't know how many times I've sat and studied with individuals and tried to emphasize authority. It's easy to understand. It's not difficult. If I were a doctor and I were to give you a prescription and you take that to the pharmacist, how does the pharmacist treat that prescription? Very strictly. He follows it to the T, as we would say back in Texas. In other words, he doesn't add anything. He doesn't take anything away. Why can't men grasp that same principle when it comes to biblical matters worship to god the way we live the way we present our bodies as a living sacrifice but the strange thing is the people have this idea that somehow you can just sort of do what you want to do april and i were in hot springs arkansas for our honeymoon and there was a lady in one of the little shops we stopped at and started pursuing a discussion with her and uh, I think she said something to this effect. It's the people, really, who are the church, and they can figure out what they need to do. That's, that wording's not exact. But it demonstrates the attitude that so many people have. Just do your own thing. I want to present a question to you here. God is the creator, right? And we're the created. So who is in a better position to tell the created how to worship the creator? Uh, that's not the dummy question for the day. It is the Creator who tells us how we are to worship Him. He has to contend lawfully. He has to contend lawfully. Look at the next illustration. There's a principle in this well, as well as we look at the application. And this is the uh, husbandman. The husbandman. I want to draw up a scenario for you to think about. Here's a man that goes down to the local bank and he wants to borrow some money to maybe improve his farm or whatever. And he goes every year. Brother Herman Beals used to tell me, he said, you know what farming is? It's going in debt for most of the year, borrowing money to cover the rest of the year and trying to figure out if you're ever going to get out of debt. <laughs> but what would you think of a man that walks into the bank and he says, I need to borrow $10,000 or $50,000? And so the banker said, your credit's good, ready to loan you. What crop are you going to grow this year? And what if he were to respond and say, well, you know, I'm not really going to grow a crop this year. I'm going to buy a new tractor and fix the house up, buy my wife some new clothes. 
but what crop are you going to plant? And he would say, well, uh, you know, I'm going to fix the barn up. Bottom line is he's not doing what produces the desired end, and that is bringing forth a crop. When he talks about this farmer, this husbandman, he's trying to get me to understand by implication here that there is a purpose for which we are here. And our purpose is not to amass wealth. In fact, there's danger in wealth. When Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he said, those that are minded to be rich, you don't have to be rich. You just have to be minded to be rich. They fall into many hurtful lusts and snares. It's because riches draw us away and will make us do things we never dreamed we would ever do. I had a gentleman in Colgate, Oklahoma I was acquainted with. He was a county clerk, member of the Lord's Church, served as a deacon. But he decided one day, I'm going to strike out to make a million dollars. Within two years' time, that man had abandoned his wife. His wife divorced him. He was heavily consumed in material things. And the last I heard, he had been arrested for beating his neighbor with a lead pipe because his neighbor's fence was six inches over onto his property. He never dreamed he would have done those kind of things. But there's danger in material things. So what is he saying through the athlete? He's saying there's a purpose there. That purpose is to get the seed into the hearts of men. And we do it through different ways. We do it by modern technology. But you cannot lose the value of doing it one-on-one. -on -one. Take a little card with you. Just give it to people when you're traveling. Just strike a conversation up with someone at the store. It's not that difficult. And you'll see, be surprised how many doors will open up. So I've got the athlete and the, the principle there, the application there is then that he has to run lawfully. The soldier, he has to make sure that he has his priorities right. And then the husbandman, you have to make sure you understand what you're here for. We're here to plant the seed. Now let's go back through these. Uh, I don't see a clock or... What time am I supposed to... All right. Let's go back through these and let's talk about what we can anticipate. The Bible has a unique way of motivating us with great promises. And uh, each one of these has what I call something to anticipate. Go back to the... Go back to the soldier. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then he says, No soldier entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may do what? Please him who enrolled him. He wants to be recognized. He wants his master to be pleased. And if I'm a good teacher and I'm a good soldier, if you will, my goal is to please Christ. I cannot imagine in the vast scope of everything, I cannot imagine how wonderful it's going to be when our Lord comes again and I hear him say to me and to all the faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. I can't imagine anything more glorious than that. I long for those words. I think you do too. Well done, good and faithful a good and faithful servant. And so the goal of the athlete then is he's got a goal of pleasing the master. That becomes his motivation. And it also becomes something I can anticipate as I look forward to being with him. Let's look at the next one. So you have the soldier that wants to please he that enrolled him as a soldier. And then you've got the athlete. And it says here he's not crowned, crowned. Uh, the Bible talks about the crown of life, the crown that we will receive. I want to go back to the illustration of Mark Spitz here for just a minute. Here was a man who spent hours, endless hours, training himself to win that gold medal. You think it was really that, well, what is it, an eight-inch medal? You think it was really that that he was after? No, no. Because he could have taken the same amount of time that he used in obtaining that crown, that recognition, and put it to just a normal occupation, and he could have been good at it. No, he was, a, he was after something far greater. For as he stands on that stand, and having won all those gold medals, and his team walks across the stage or in front of him, and the American flag is raised, and they're honored, he's after the recognition 
I want to be recognized by my Father. I want to be recognized by the angels in heaven. For what did Jesus say in that beautiful chapter on Luke chapter 15 on the different parables? Here are those who want to please the Father. The great joy in heaven that comes from a soul that's saved. And so I strive for that in order to get recognition from the Father, to enjoy His blessings. I anticipate that. I long for that, as I'm sure that you do too. Let's look at the third one here, if you will. So I have the soldier, I've got the athlete, and then I've got the husbandman. And it says that he is the first to enjoy the fruits. He gets the first fruits. I wrestled with what that meant for a long time. How is it that the soldier, I mean the uh, farmer, the Christian farmer analogy, how is it that he enjoys the first fruits? And I think after several years of teaching and being privileged to baptize people into Christ, I think it has something to do with this. There was a gentleman I baptized, he had to have weighed 250, maybe 300 pounds. And I was still rather small back in those days. And when I took him into the baptistry and I baptized him, the water filled all the way to the top, Jim. Ever done that on you? And it poured into my waders. I was soaking wet. But when he came out of that water, he gave me a bear hug. And anything that was dry at that point ceased to be dry. But I enjoyed it. With tears running down their cheeks, they're saying to you, the joy of becoming a child of God is immeasurable. And I am the first one that gets to partake in that. You teach someone. You may not have the privilege of actually baptizing them, but when you're sitting in the audience and here is a precious soul that you've been instrumental in teaching, and you've led them to Christ, and you see them make the good confession, and they're buried in that water or grave of baptism, there's a joy to that that is inexplicable. I can't put it into words. I think that's what he's trying to communicate here. No, he doesn't state it in so many words, but he states it in the principle. So the farmer, the first to partake of his fruits, that's us. We're planting a seed. Now don't miss, please don't miss that all three of these analogies have to do with the teacher. Being a teacher. Yes, there is a sense in which we are soldiers in the army of God, and we have the adequate armor, Ephesians chapter 10, verses 10, and Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and following. But don't miss the fact that these are analogies of the Christian teacher. And the same with all of those analogies. So every one of these are designed to help me understand and to enjoy the blessing of being a teacher. Now, if I haven't motivated you in some way, <laughs> To want to go out there and be a teacher, I wish there were some words I could speak to tell you the great joy that awaits you. So I've seen three analogies, the farmer, the soldier, and the athlete. I've seen three principles that come out of that, principle of priorities with regard to the soldier. I've seen the principle of contending lawfully according to the athlete, and I've seen the principle of uh, getting the seed in the ground. And I've also seen some great rewards that come with it. Let us be teachers of God's word. Let's be faithfully abounding in his work. And our labor will not be in vain. I'm going to give you, what, ten minutes back? Can we quit? Sure. All right. You are dismissed. Thank you.